Remember, we started talking about, in this chapter, all about the atom. And so that's what we had on this test, or this quiz. What we didn't have on this quiz was we started talking about what happens when atoms become unstable. Remember, we just said radioactivity is just another word for unstable. When we have small atoms, this positive and negative effect kind of bounces out the atom. But once we get to these heavier atoms, depending on the number of neutrons in the nucleus, these atoms can become unstable. And when an atom becomes unstable, remember, one of three things can happen. It can be an alpha particle, a beta particle, or a gamma ray. Okay? But just like we saw before with conservation of energy, we're not really losing anything here. We're just rearranging it. So if I start with a uranium atom with a mass number of 238 and an atomic number of 92, that means that whatever I go to is going to have a mass number of 238 and an atomic number of 92. It might be in two pieces here, but the total is still going to be that same thing. Now, what we didn't get to in last class was saying, well, how do we tell how radioactive something is? And that's where this idea of half-life comes into play. Half-life tells us how long it takes for half of a sample to decay. Okay. And so I keep using uranium as an example here. Well, we know uranium-235, that's the stuff they use in nuclear reactors. And it's radioactive. But Carbon-14 is also radioactive. And carbon-14, maybe one in every thousand carbon atoms is carbon-14. Okay. What's made of carbon in this room? Uh, uh, everything that was at one time alive. Okay. So us, our clothing, these tabletops, the plastic and the chairs and the garbage can, anything that was once alive, all right, has some amount of carbon in it. So that means while there's only one in every thousand atoms is carbon-14, there are trillions and trillions and quadrillions of carbon-14 atoms in here. Well, this is also radioactive. Okay, We're exposed to this every day and there's no problem. But would you want to hold a bucket of nuclear fuel? No. <laughs> that seems like a bad idea, right? And that's good. <laughs> okay, Because that is a bad idea. Well, the difference here is the half-life, okay? And so your book uses thorium as an example. And remember, thorium we saw was a byproduct of uranium decaying. Thorium has a half-life of 24 days. What this means is that if you start with 100 grams, all right, after 24 days, you'd be left with 50 grams. After another 24 days, you'd be left with 25 grams, then 12.5, then 6.25, and you keep going keep decreasing by half. We can never exactly say when that last thorium atom is going to decay. All we can say is that we're going to keep decreasing by half every 24 days. Now, this should be a little weird because this isn't how most things operate, right? Most things operate, all right, once after a certain amount of time, we know we'll be gone, all right? You know if you're driving around in your car, all right, after 200, 300 miles, eventually you're going to run out of gas. You're not going to keep decreasing by half. That just doesn't make sense. But the kind of interesting thing about radioactive things is that it's all probability. Anyone taking a probability class? That sucked. <laughs> well, we won't spend too much time on it today, all right? But the basics of probability aren't that bad, okay? If I flip a coin 100 times, about how many times will it end up heads? 50. How about half the time? Okay, 50. It might be 51, it might be 49, but most times it's going to be about 50. All right? What if by some strange miracle, okay, I flipped a coin 100 times and every single time it came up heads? All right. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Okay, if we, let's say it came up 
I don't know, maybe we have a perfectly balanced coin, and it came up 100 heads each time. See, you say you hate probability, but then you're getting excited about this, you know? <laughs> what are the chances that on that 101st flip, it would come up heads? Uh, if it came up heads 100 times, what? Now, this is, a, this is a good example of why casinos make a lot of money, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Be, because you think it can beat the system. But the truth is that no matter how many times it came up heads before, there's still a 50-50 ch shot on that 101st time it'll come up heads, all right? It doesn't matter what happened before. All I know is that every time I flip that coin, there's a 50-50 shot or a 51%, 49% shot of it being heads, okay? And that's the same thing with half-life, okay? After that first half-life, after 24 days for thorium, I'm gonna have 50 grams left. This 50 grams of thorium doesn't know, doesn't care what happened before. All it knows is that in another 24 days, half of it's gonna be gone. Even if we go down to one thorium atom, if I have one thorium atom, the only thing I can say is that in 24 days, there's a 50-50 shot of that thorium atom being gone. If I come back after 24 days and I still have a thorium atom, the only thing I can say is that in another 24 days, there's a 50-50 shot that will be gone. That's it. That one thorium atom could just survive forever. But just like flipping a coin 100 times and it being 100 times heads, that's not very likely, all right? And so what this also means is that we don't really have a direct route to figure out how long it's gonna take for something to decay. We have to go step by step. It's your homework. Everyone go home and watch step by step tonight. <laughs> Come on, you guys aren't that young, are you? <laughs> no one's ever seen a rerun of step by step. Oh, come on. Fine, fine. I'm ancient, you know, you guys just just ignore what I say about TV shows. <laughs> Good God. <sighs> I am getting old. All right. <laughs> Let, let's say we have uranium-235, okay? Now, different atoms, different isotopes are going to have different half-lives, all right? You don't have to memorize that, all right? But all I'm saying is for uranium-235, the half-life is equal to about two years. About. Okay. So if I start with 100 grams, I want to figure out, let's say, how much will be left after 10 years. We can do that. Now, there's no way for us to jump from two years to, to 10 years. The only thing I can do is I can say, well, let's do it one step at a time. So after two years, after one half-life, how much uranium is going to be left? 50. You guys are like rolling your eyes at me and saying, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. After four years, two half-lives, how much is left? 25. Six years? 12.5. Eight years? 6.25. 10 years? 3.125. And that's it. That's all, half, there, that's all there is to half-life, all right? Just dividing by half every time. So it makes sense to want the radioactive waste in the mountains and just expect it to be gone. It won't be gone. Well, no, no one knows it's going to be gone. But the reason they put it in a mountain is to just shield yeah. all that extra stuff. And well, this is, the, this is the problem with radioactive waste to begin with, okay? You start with, I don't know, most radioactive waste is like krypton, xenon, barium, things like that, okay? So just like we were talking about before, you start with that, which has half-life of I don't know, 100 years, okay? But then that decays into something else, which has a half-life of I don't know, 200 years. So that decays into something else that has another half-life. So really, you keep 
You keep breaking it down, you keep breaking it down. You've got one wrong, you just break down the next half. Well, <laughs> and it depends. It doesn't, it doesn't always fall exactly like that. I mean, eventually you'll get to something that has a longer half-life. But the benefit of a longer half-life is that longer half-life means it's not as dangerous for the most part. So the radioactivity is just the number of the, the particles. Yeah. So that radioactivity, what's dangerous is just those alpha particles, those beta particles, and those gamma rays. Okay? Because what I'm saying here is that each time this breaks down, okay, we're getting less and less, but at the same time, that other 50 grams isn't disappearing. Okay? For, so for uranium, uranium, that probably means that I'm going to have now 50 grams of thorium. Okay? And then so here I'm going to have now 75 grams of thorium, okay, and then 87.5 grams of thorium, okay. So remember, it's not disappearing; it's just turning into something else, okay. Because we're never going to lose it, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, here's the problem, okay? So that uranium breaks down. We're going to actually talk about fission in a little bit. That uranium breaks down. That uranium breaks down to things like krypton, barium, whatever. The rods are worthless? Yes, okay. yes. And at the same time, too, if you, have, if you have something that's decaying like that, okay, you have all these particles that are now shooting stuff into the water. So now the water itself is radioactive. Okay, because that water is going to absorb some of that energy and then re-emit it. So then you can't just dump that water back into the stream. You have to get rid of that radioactivity. The water has dropped already. That's already yeah. Okay. Yeah. As long as it's keeping its rules on the theory. Uh, man, see, these are all good <laughs> questions. <laughs> these are all good questions. You know, I should actually, I actually have a good comic about that. But for that, putting nuclear waste in a pool is actually a great great thing to do, all right? <laughs> I know you don't believe me, all right? But if I dump a lot of nuclear waste in, say, like a normal-sized swimming pool, okay, I could swim around on top of that pool all day, every day, and just be perfectly fine. In fact, I'd probably be better than fine, because every day we're exposed to radiation from a number of sources, but being in water blocks some of that radiation, okay? It's such a good blocker that I'd have to get down so close to it like a couple feet away before I'd feel any dangerous effects from that because it blocks so much of that. So you said that uranium 235 would only take two years to reform the whole point two years. Yeah, five. about. That's not the same processing like a nuclear weapon, right? No. Okay. Well, let's, let's go ahead and skip, let's skip to that. We can actually, we'll come back to this half-life in a little bit, all right? So in a nuclear reactor, all right, instead of everything decaying naturally, what we actually have is we take that uranium-235 and actually shoot a neutron at it, okay? Well, if you have this already unstable atom, unstable nucleus, and you shoot a neutron at it, what do you think is going to happen? Is that going to make it more stable or less stable? Less stable, all right? If you have a big bucket of gasoline, you shoot a gun at it. I mean, what's going to happen there? Okay, come on. Maybe it's made of metal. Maybe there's a spark or something. Give me a break. <laughs> Is it a good idea to shoot a gun at a big bucket of gasoline? Okay, fine. There we go. All right. No matter what, we can agree that's not a great idea. All right. <laughs> anyway, so if we shoot a neutron at a uranium atom, instead of decaying naturally, instead of just a tiny piece breaking off, what we're actually going to happen here is that this uranium atom is going to split into two big chunks. Okay? And so one of those chunks might be krypton 136 and 56, whatever that is, barium 133.56. So now instead of one little piece coming off, I have two medium-sized chunks. Well, what's wrong? What am I missing here? What is wrong with this equation right now? 
Is the atomic number all right? Well, the atomic number is fine, right? 92, 36, 56. Yeah. Yeah, no, but you're right. The mass number is missing something. How many is the mass number missing? Not two. Three. We have 235 plus 1. It's so a 236 and 100 plus 133. So what we're actually missing here are three more neutrons. Okay. Well, if I have a big bucket of uranium here, and I fire a neutron at it, that breaks up one uranium atom. What do you think these three other neutrons are going to do? Hit other uranium atoms. Okay. And then split them and split them and split them. I'll come back to this. So what we actually call this is a chain reaction. Okay. So every time we split one of those uranium atoms, we're going to have at least two ne neutrons come off, which are going to split two more and two more, and it's just going to increase exponentially. Well, not, sun's not, not this. It's fusion. Okay. It's the actual opposite. But this is actually what happens in a nuclear bomb. Okay. Within the span of about half a millisecond, all that uranium is split. Now, each time this reaction happens, we release a little bit of energy. So if this, all this reaction happens within, I don't know, a couple pounds of uranium in the span of half a millisecond, all this energy is released at once, and you have this huge, huge explosion. Exactly. I mean, because this, this is a ridiculous amount of energy, okay? I mean, uranium, if I have a bucket of uranium here, that's the equivalent energy of, I don't know, can't even, like um, one of those super tankers full of gasoline, <laughs> okay? Because there's so much energy contained in the nucleus of each of these atoms that when they split, they release some of this energy, okay? And that's what makes that so powerful. But this is the exact same reaction that's happening in a nuclear reactor. Exactly the same. Okay? The only difference is in a nuclear reactor, it's under control. So instead of this all happening in the span of half a millisecond, okay, we draw this out slowly over time. So we use that energy for heat to turn water to steam, to turn a turbine. But the other thing that's exactly the same here is that we still have to follow the same rules. The mass number on the left has to equal the mass number on the right. That's it. And so since this is so unstable, the same thing doesn't really happen every time. Okay. So sometimes when I hit that uranium atom, I get krypton and barium. But other times I could hit it and I could get, hold on, let me should spend a second here. Yeah, strontium and whatever 54 is, xenon. Okay. How many neutrons am I missing here? Four. Okay. My atomic number is still the same. Okay, but I'm, my mass number's off by four. And so each of those neutrons just has a mass number of one and no atomic number. So this time I'm missing four neutrons. But now this is also why we have to have some amount of critical mass. So I think about it. These neutrons are splitting off. Not every one of them is going to hit a uranium atom. So that's why each split is more, normally more than four. And so to have a critical mass, you have to have it so that every split splits at least a little bit more than one other uranium atom. Well, yeah. Well, well the, pro the problem here, all right, is that this produces a ton of energy every time. But you're left with strontium, xenon, barium, krypton. All right, which produce are radioactive themselves. They're not radioactive enough that you can split them to use in a reactor, but they're still going to produce all those byproducts we talked about before. So 
Fusion doesn't do that. But if we keep going here a little bit, okay, uranium is not the only thing that can undergo fission. We can also have something like plutonium. So the only other thing I could ask you on the quiz or test or I want you to know is, well, let's say this time we had strontium again, 102.38, not STR. <laughs> I think my handwriting's getting worse here. But then what would come out if we had three neutrons created? Can you guys take them in and do that? Remember, just the same rules as before, okay? Our atomic numbers have to be equal, and our mass numbers have to be equal. My handwriting is definitely looking worse. <laughs> What's the new atomic number going to be here? Atomic number? 56. Yeah, 56, right? So we have 94 over here. So we need 94 over here, so that means we need 56, okay? What's the mass number going to be? 1 what? So we have 245 here, and then 102 plus 3 times 1, so 105. Yeah, so just 140. And so if we look at the periodic table, 56, gives us back to barium again. So the same rules apply here. We still have to have those numbers balance out. All right? And once again, we can, this is perfectly all right to end up sometimes with barium-140 and sometimes barium-133. Depending on that isotope, that atom is going to stay around longer or shorter amount of time. Okay. Now, we are kind of skipping all around, but that's because you guys are asking good questions today. Okay. So this is what we call fission. So fission is when we have one thing splitting. What's happening on the sun is a little bit different. Okay. What's happening on the sun, let's get past that, is fusion. That's definitely not how you spell fusion. <laughs> okay. So nuclear fusion is the opposite. So if I say fission is big atoms splitting, what's the opposite of that? What? Yeah, combining. Small atoms coming together. Okay? So if these two atoms combine, what atom is it going to be? What's the mass number going to be? Four. What's the atomic number? Two. So yeah, you're absolutely right. That's helium. Okay. So every time this happens, we also have energy. Okay. Why do you think this is more difficult than fission? What do you think the problem here is? Well, that's, I mean, we can still manipulate hydrogen atoms. Well, not really. I mean, this is actually, most hydrogen is hydrogen 1-1. One, one. Hydrogen 2-1 is actually called deuterium. But once again, maybe one in every 10,000 
hydrogen atoms is deuterium. Well, where is there a lot of hydrogen just sitting around? I'm not letting you off the hook with this one. Where is there a ton of hydrogen not being used for much at all? Water. Water. All right? In the oceans. Okay? Water is two-thirds hydrogen. Okay? So we have tons and tons of this. This is readily available, free, cheap. This doesn't produce any nasty byproducts. But what is the problem here? Why, why do you think this is difficult? Why do you think it's difficult to get the nucleus of this deuterium to fuse with the nucleus of this other deuterium? What is going to really try to oppose that? Exactly. We have a positive charge here and we have a positive charge here. These guys don't want to be shoved together. Okay? This doesn't want to happen. So you need a lot of energy to get this started. Well, that's easy enough on the sun, right? Sun something like, I don't know, a couple million degrees or something like that. Okay? So it already has a lot of energy to push them together. And once you get them pushed together, it releases even more energy. But it's getting that started that's the difficult part. And what they say when they say cold fusion is that we do this without a lot of heat. Because this is possible. People do this on Earth. We can get this to happen. But we have to put more energy in than we get out. Okay? So it's not really practical yet. Okay? But just like before, right, no matter what we're doing here, Numbers on the left have to equal the numbers on the right. And what we're going to see as we move forward here is that all these reactions are very difficult. This was first done on Earth in the 90s. Okay? When was the first fission reaction done? Yeah. Okay. In the, in the 40s, during the end of the World War II. Okay? It took years and untold money to to just get this started for a bomb. This is the simplest, simplest way, all right, to get this reaction to happen. So this is very difficult to do, all right? What I'd like you to do over break is go back here and try to do these homework problems, okay? We're going to spend a little bit more time when we come back reviewing half-life, reviewing fission and fusion before we move on to the next chapter, okay? But I like it, and remember, all these are basically the same thing. All these are just balancing these equations. Okay? Have the same on the left and the right. All right? Any questions about anything we did today? Yeah. Yeah. Well, remember when I talk about those, when I talk about those neutrons, when I put that five here. That just means I have five neutrons. So it has a five times one, five mass number, and five times zero, nothing for the atomic number. Yeah. Well, because remember, you have to have that first neutron to start with. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you guys week after next. Have a good uh, break. Thank you.